You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. The scripture passage for today is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. The peace of Christ must control your hearts, a peace into which you were called in one body, and be thankful people. The word of Christ must live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God through him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, welcome back for the final week in our sermon series that we've been in for the last several weeks entitled Stale. For the last week, we've been having a conversation in and around the topic of boredom. What does it mean and what do we do when all the arenas of our lives grow dull? They become underwhelming. They feel stagnant, if you will. If you're just joining us, we've covered a whole bunch of different areas. We've talked about spiritual staleness. We've talked about professional staleness. We've talked about what do we do, what does it mean when our material possessions, all the things that have been entrusted to us, grow and feel stale. And today we're going to wrap up with one last conversation. Today we're going to engage the topic around relational staleness. What does it mean... And what do we do when our relationships, primarily our romantic ones, feel stagnant? The first thing we're not going to do is freak out, okay? And the reason for which is because, quick show of hands if you have been together with your partner for, let's go, uh, 10 years or more. Look at that. 15 or more. I love doing this. I got weddings and stuff. 20 or more. 25, 30. All right, let's stop and just give all of those folks a round of applause for that. Amazing, amazing. And I hope you're paying attention uh, to the people around you who are holding up their hand longer than you because they can probably teach you, they can tell you that every single relationship that you're a part of, friendships, romantic ones, you name it, they ebb and they flow. And when they ebb, or flow, I can't tell which one's the bad one, uh, the negative one. (laughs) I would offer to you two possible explanations. Number one, there's nothing wrong, you're just changing. 
If you're with someone for a really, really long time, you change. They change. And I love this from Stanley Hauerwas. He was one of my theologian uh, professors uh, at Duke Divinity School. He used to say this, at times, relationships require you to learn how to love the stranger that you find yourself married to. As you change and they change, your task, the longer you're in a committed relationship with them, is to relearn how to love the new person you find yourself with. Now, that's one explanation. Another explanation is you have gotten off track. You stopped investing as much. You stopped caring as much. Or you started treating one another with unhealthy or unrealistic expectations. And that happens to all of us as well. And so the question today is, what do we do uh, when that happens? And before we get to the answers to that, we actually need to back up and ask a much larger question, which is, what is God's expectations for our relationships at all? What is the design and the intentionality that God builds in and bakes into what and how we ought to engage our close, intimate relationships? And for answers to that, we're going to turn to our scripture passage for today. So if you have your Bibles with you uh, today, or if you're watching us online and want to hit pause and grab a Bible, feel free to do so. Today we're going to be camped out in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. And if you're new to studying scripture, uh, Colossians is like many of the books in the New Testament. It is a letter written by Paul to the early church in Colossae. And so uh, he's writing to them, teaching them all these sort of different forms and facets of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I want to point out one really prominent theme in this book. You'll see it run throughout the entire book. Over and over again, Paul says, when you sign up to be a follower of Jesus, when you sign up and say, I'm going to take my spiritual life seriously, I want to commit my life to Jesus, he says, what that looks like is it looks like taking off your old nature and putting on your new nature. He uses the analogy of clothing. You are to take off one set of clothing that is going out of date. It's not serving you uh, anymore. It's not doing you any favors. And you put on something new. Not too dissimilar from when you run into a dad wearing cargo shorts, right? When you see someone in wearing these, you say, hey, help a brother out. There's other things. There's other styles available uh, to you. However, I will say, uh, the older I get, uh, I find myself in need of more pockets. And the other day, I was like, if only I had like a here. And that's how it starts, right there. That's how it starts. But this is the message. Paul is saying, the longer you follow Jesus, the more you should be taking off old behaviors, old habits that are not serving you, they're harming you, they're harming the people around you, and you are to put on new ones, better ones, more excellent ones, he says. Now, I want you to pay attention to something. If you have your Bibles and smart devices and you're tracking, pay attention to where Paul goes next. So where he goes right after this, right after our passage that we just heard William read a moment ago, is he does this dive into relationships. He talks about relationships between uh, husband and wife. He talks about relationships between uh, parents uh, and uh, their children. He sort of launches into this conversation around all these relationships. And why this is so important is because I have a pro tip for you whenever you're studying scripture. Whenever you're studying scripture, your tip is this. Always, if you're trying to understand kind of the, the, the larger point the author is making, stop and read what happens right before the passage you just read and right after the passage you just read. That's always a really, really important thing because it'll help you understand the greater context, the bigger point that the author is trying to make. Think of it like a Netflix show. Sometimes, I don't know about you, I need that recap at the beginning of the episode. I need the like, last time on Suits or whatever to sort of help me understand, oh yeah, 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 that's the context. And so that's gonna matter when uh, we get to that scene. Similarly, this really plays an important part what happens after our passages. And so, Let's kind of put it all together. When you put all of that together, what you begin to see is Paul is trying to show us, he's trying to teach us, again, what is God's original design and purpose for the relationships in our lives? And he's pointing out that for so many of us, we enter into relationships with all kinds of different motivations. Sometimes we enter into a romantic relationship to get revenge on an ex. 
Sometimes we enter into a romantic relationship because we don't want to be lonely. Sometimes we enter into a romantic relationship uh, for cheap, quick intimacy. Other times we uh, enter into a relationship because we've got this emotional void inside of us and we think that this person will fill it. And Paul, and we're going to get into the meat of this in a moment, by putting these two things together, what he's saying is this, that the primary motivation for why you and I ought to enter in a relationship should be aligned with God's ultimate design for relationships, which is this. God's ultimate design for the relationships that you're in are to help make each other new. It's not to make each other happy all the time. It's not to keep each other happy all the time. It's not to entertain one another. It's not to fill voids within one another. The design that God has for our relationships in the Christian life is to be for one another a spiritual discipline, a spiritual exercise in putting on that new nature. And why that's so important is because when we waver from that, when we veer off from that in our romantic relationships, not only can they, will they grow stale, but you can actually see them negatively affect your relationship with God in the process. Just check it out. So now we're going to get into, let's get into the content of what uh, Paul writes in verses 12 through 16. Because what he does here, now that we know the context, now we know the larger point he's making about relationships, what he's doing here in these verses is he's giving you the traits. He's giving you sort of like the defining characteristics of what is the marker of a godly relationship, a God-centered relationship. Which... By the way, as an aside, I find it quite alarming that there's pockets of Christianity who define godly relationships simply based off of whether or not the persons in that relationship fit a certain gender or uh, sort of our sexuality box rather than how we actually treat one another. I find it interesting that that's the sort of criteria that there are some churches, some uh, Christians will make as to what qualifies as a godly relationship. It's about labels, it's about categories, not how we actually engage and show up for one another. But I digress, but I digress. So um, let's go into uh, the the content, the meat of what uh, Paul says. Let's look at verses uh, 12 and 13. First thing he says is this, therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, be tolerant with each other. And if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive each other. So trait, characteristic, what does it look like to possess, to get back to a godly relationship, a God-centered relationship when it grows stale or when you veer off course? It looks like this, number one, having a grace-driven relationship rather than a revenge-driven relationship. If sometimes you find yourself stale or drifting away from one another, ask yourself, is our relationship built on grace, compassion, forgiveness, the things that Paul's talking about, or do we never miss an opportunity to hold a grudge? This is the old nature, right? This is the way the old clothing would talk to us. Someone messes up, you keep a list, you keep a record. You keep an invoice of all the things wrong that they've done to you so that you can use it against them. I'll use my own dating uh, career uh, to tell on myself and give you examples of this. One of the things I'm not proud of, one of the things I regret is early in my dating career, this is the way in which uh, I used to uh, engage in fights with uh, a romantic partner. I had several romantic partners say to me that uh, if I wasn't uh, going on to become a preacher, I should definitely become a lawyer because I love to litigate. I love to litigate. That's what I used to do. Whenever you get into an argument, I would just sort of store up all of these uh, things that I know this person has done wrong. And then when something would happen, I would use all of them against them. And some of those were months old, years old even. Let's not forget about what you did March of 2018. Thank you very much. I would bring up all of these things. I would just sort of bury them in evidence that they, what they have done is wrong to me. It's harmed me. It's pained me. And the reason why I did that is because I thought that would protect me from being hurt again. That if I could just convince them of all that they've hurt me with, they won't do it anymore. And I learned a couple of things through living that way, doing it the 
old way. Number one, I learned that sometimes our methods for protecting ourselves from harm end up harming those we promise to protect. Sometimes our methods for protecting ourselves, maybe because we got hurt before and we're trying to not make that happen again, sometimes our methods for protecting ourselves end up doing either the same harm or a different version of harm to the person we're with. And the other thing I learned is this, that if grace has no place in a relationship, not only is it going to grow stale, but if grace has no place in your relationships, friends, you'll be miserable. Miserable. Because if you look for things wrong in another person, you'll find them all day. And I would argue if grace has no place, if it never shows up in your relationships, I would take a very long look in the mirror and ask yourself, is it actually a relationship you're looking for or someone you want to control? So Paul asks us that question in verses 12 and 13. If you want to put on the new nature, you want to sort of, re- sort of work against the staleness that sometimes creeps in, is it grace-based or revenge-based? He keeps going. Verse 15. Verse 15, it says this, the peace of Christ, uh, control your hearts, a peace into which you are called in one body, and be thankful people. So when you find yourself uh, in a stale or your relationship has gone sort of adrift and you've sort of drifted from one another, another question to ask yourself, according to Paul, is this. Not only uh, is it grace-driven versus revenge-driven, but he says uh, you, the godly relationships, God-centered relationships, the other thing that they look like, one of the things, the characteristics that define them is they allow peace, not fear, to control their hearts, to control their actions. Why? Well, again, I don't know about you, but when the old nature, when the old clothing is telling me what to do, it tells me that I ought to allow my fears, my insecurities, my baggage, uh, my anxieties, let those be the things uh, that control you. Let those be the things that control the things that you say to them, the things that you do uh, with them. Again, another thing that I'm not proud of in my own dating history is that whenever I was in a relationship with someone and I was feeling insecure, which we've all been there, we've all been there. When I was feeling insecure, one of the ways in which I would sort of counteract that insecurity is I would either constantly seek reassurance from this person. I know you said that you like me, but do you still like me? I know that was five minutes ago, but like, are you sure you like me? Um, I remember when I was dating a girl and I got uh, diamond studded earrings, piercings, and I'd asked her like just about every single minute after that, are you sure you like me? I don't even know if I like me at the current moment, and so I want to be sure that this is still working for you and for us. Um, So I would either do that or I would just act out. You ever uh, caused a fight with someone just to see if they still like you, see if they still will fight for you? Again, not proud of it, but here we are. Um, And I learned something. I learned something through that sort of impulse inside of me. I learned two things that every single person in this room, I don't care how healthy you are, every single one of us, we enter into relationships with emotional deficiencies, emotional deficits, or the term we're all used to, we have a void inside of us, a need that somewhere along the way in our upbringing did not get fulfilled. And I learned that not only is it not possible, it is very unfair to ask your romantic partner to fill that for you. Again, I'm a visual person. I love a graph. And so check out this. Uh, I don't know, what's the Venn diagram with three? Someone can tell me later. Uh, But here we go. Uh, This is the way in which I see sort of the relationships uh, that we're in. When it comes to, well, when I show up in a relationship, there are certainly things uh, that me and my partner can fill in and for one another. That sort of is where you see like that purple meets the green, the blue situation. However, there are also a bunch of things in my life that are my responsibility to address. And there's a bunch of things in my life that are me and Jesus' responsibility to iron out and to work out. And what's not referenced on this is there are also things that when I show up in a relationship and I haven't fully worked through all my baggage and the stuff that I've come in with, there are things that I need to go with my therapist and work through and process with. Healthy relationships look like this. Healthy relationships understand that there might be some needs that my partner can fill, but they will never fill all of them. 
and I've got to find who and where are the places where God has created and given me space to meet those needs. And thirdly and finally, let's go to the last part of the, uh, the passage for today. Verses 16 through 17, Paul says this. The other thing that he writes is he says, and again, he's, gonna, he's talking about relationships. So all of this is aimed towards our relationship life. He says, let the word of Christ, let it live in you richly. Teach and warn each other with all wisdom by singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing to God with gratitude. And whatever you do, whether in speech or in action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And give thanks to God the Father through him. Trait number three, characteristic number three, at least according to Paul, of what a godly, God-centered relationship looks like, is it looks like couples, looks like partners who seek Jesus' teaching rather than the world's opinion on what we want and what we need in that relationship. Why does Paul prescribe this? Because I don't know about you, every day I wake up, I have a family member or I have a friend or I have tons of voices on social media telling me what type of relationship I should have or I should want. And they make me, most of the time, feel bad about the current status of my relationship, that it's not in this perfect glowing state that this person, this voice, this account seems to be prescribing. Again, one more example from my own dating career. This time, I wasn't the one in the relationship. I was the negative influencing friend on the outside. Uh, So when we were in college, I went to a private Christian college, uh, and we uh, would have chapel three times a week, and we'd have summit weeks where we'd bring in these guest speakers. I'll never forget one year, we brought in this couple, this husband-wife duo, and they had been married for 27 years, and the whole weekend was on godly relationships. And they would just talk this whole time about how perfect their relationship was. When they were looking for times to reconnect, sometimes they'd go for walks and hold hands, and one of them would leave a hand for Jesus, and they would just sort of walk together. This was their relationship. This was the model example that they were giving to us. No flaws, no struggles. They would pray 17 times a day. They would stop in the middle of the work week. How are you? Do you need a moment? I'll come to you. Like, they just sort of painted this picture of what it means to have a godly relationship. And so we're a bunch of 18-year-olds going, oh, okay, that's That's the goal. That's what we're aiming for. Two days later, I'm sitting with a friend, and he confides in me. He says, yeah, I got this new relationship, and I don't know. Like, I'm just, I don't know uh, if this person is the one. Uh, It's still early. I'm still trying to figure it out. And I came right in. I was like, well, you were in chapel, weren't you? You saw the types of things we ought to be aiming for. If you don't have that. So I was comparing his day seven with this person to their year 27, right? If you don't have that, you know what you ought to do? Dump her. Yes, get rid of it. Just be done with it. And he did. And he did. Now, the beautiful part of the story is eventually both of them saw through the foolishness of what I said. They not only got back together, uh, but they are happily married to this day. And I was a groomsman in the wedding, which made the rehearsal super awkward. Super awkward. I'm very, I'm here to support you, I promise. Anyway, I learned also through that experience, and I learned this particularly two years later when I found out it came out publicly uh, that that, uh, the couple, the husband was cheating uh, on the wife. And I learned something really important. I learned that when you're in a relationship and it becomes stale and it feels stagnant, um, I mean, let's just be honest, there is an impulse inside of you to compare your relationship with that of other people. Or, even worse, we compare our partner with someone else. And when that happens, friends, it's just really, really important that we remember a couple of really, really quick things. Number one, so many of you, have, have you seen this meme uh, on Facebook before? Have uh, you seen this meme before? <laughs> now, the girl version too, right? Okay. Um, This tendency, this impulse inside of us uh, to look around, to fantasize about someone else or someone else's marriage, someone else's relationship, when yours becomes dull. It's a failure to realize two things, or to remember two things. Number one, uh, if you were to follow through on that impulse, most of the time what you're doing is you're simply swapping out your current and your normal issues (laughs) with just a brand new batch of them. 
again, think of this uh, couple. They had their own issues. That person had their own issues. Any person you enter in a relationship with, you're just going to receive a brand new batch of them. And they might even be worse than the ones you got. And the second thing I learned through that experience was the old proverb that is as corny and as hokey as it is, dadgummit, it's so true. If you want greener grass, you better water the one you got. That's the only path. So I'll close here. Today we're going to close, uh, we're going to wrap up um, around this table. We're going to receive communion today. And we're going to reflect over the next several moments over Christ's sacrifice for us. And I want to remind you as we close out today that any time and every time we receive this meal, it's not just meant to go, oh my gosh, look what Jesus did for me, like that's so sweet. Yeah, I mean, yes, that's, that's part of it. But the other part of it is, is every single time we reflect upon Christ's sacrifice for us, don't forget that the call upon your life, the call upon my life, is to make a sacrifice as well. If you want that new nature, you want that new nature to live in you, to live on you, to be in your marriage, to be in your dating, be in your relationships, you are going to have to sacrifice something old, something that ain't working and it ain't serving you. And maybe that journey starts today. Maybe for you, the thing that you need to sacrifice is this old habit of just keeping score, keeping a record of all the wrong things that people do against you, and you hold grudges. You've become a pro at holding a grudge. Maybe that's the thing that needs to die today. Maybe for you, uh, it is uh, this uh, unwillingness to face your own baggage, your own wounds, and so as a result, you just continue to project those things onto the people you're in a relationship with, and you say, it's, nope, it's your job to fix me. It's your job to make me whole. Maybe that's the thing that needs to die. Or maybe, let's just be real, maybe it's this habit you've gotten into of when things aren't right, things don't feel sort of as connected, you fantasize about what life would look like with someone else. You begin to compare. What would it be like to be with them instead? Maybe that's the thing that needs to die. And I know it's scary. For some of us, those habits, they die hard. And they've been a part of your sort of operating system for a long time. But what I'm asking you to do today is I'm asking you to trust that Jesus' way is far better than your way. That this new way, this new nature is so much better than the old one. And if you choose to do so today, you choose to make a step in that today, worst case scenario, you become a healthier and holier person for the next person that God is preparing you to be in a relationship with. Best case scenario, you watch before your very eyes the resurrection of a marriage, of a partnership, that you thought was gone forever. Thank you for listening to the Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.